I've really tried to find out what God wants me to do. And I've got something on my heart that seemingly, if you look at a church full of people, we would assume, as I have heard others assume, that we all look like church people, right? I mean, we all look like we're sane and in our right mind today. And it seems like that everybody here is on their way to heaven. It seems like that you don't have a care in the world. But yet I do know there's people carrying burdens in this room. And I don't never know, there's probably 10 or 12 people even watching online right now that I never know who's going to hear what. And like Brother Wes said the other day, we don't know who's listening. We, we, that, that's the, the element of the internet now. We, we don't know who's hearing these messages anymore. So I just have to share with you what I believe God has put in my heart today. Again, it's kind of just some different thoughts that I hope that make sense. I never have a perfect outline. I don't know what a perfect outline even looks like when it comes to putting together the perfect sermon. Some guys, they, they preach masterpieces of sermons, and I, I'm not that type of guy. I preach what I feel like God puts in my heart, and God becomes the masterpiece, not me. So we've changed up this whole thing today for this moment. The struggle of and the tension of getting to this place. You and I have had the greatest experience of our entire life if we have accepted Jesus Christ, the Son of God, into our lives and made Him Lord over everything in our life. Heard it said years ago, there's a difference in calling Him Master and calling Him Lord. Because when you have allowed Him to be Lord over your life, Every decision that you and I will ever make must first run through the filter of the Holy Spirit. We inquire of God and we see what God has to say about it. There are multitudes of individuals today that, that don't know Him. And the message that I've had on my mind pretty much all week since I come back into town has simply been a message that was on my mind before I went out of town. And it just simply talks about the, the, the grace of God. I am amazed at the grace of God. I mean, I am overwhelmed at the gift of grace that God has given you and given me and given us the opportunity to even be saved, to be born Again, you know and I know without me being redundant and repetitive and going back and talking about that whole thing because I didn't necessarily go there and study this. But it fits in and it goes exactly where I'm at with this this morning that Jesus talked to this young man and his name was Nicodemus. And remember a couple of weeks ago when I was there talking about that in John 3? Well, he told, Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, marvel not that I say unto thee that you must be born again. So the scripture that I didn't give Kathy that's upon my heart this morning is where I kindly wanted to start this morning and see where we end up anyway within the next hour, give or take a few minutes. It's over in 1 John chapter 1. 1 John, not John, but 1 John. Chapter number 1. And I want to just simply share with you for the next little bit the gift of grace. What a wonderful, wonderful gift 
that God has given you and me. This wonderful gift of salvation. The best thing that could ever happen to your life is to get saved. To give your heart to Jesus. Even as a young person, you may be here even now and you're thinking, well, I'll do that when I get 35, 36, 37. Do you realize how quick the years will roll by? One of the greatest things that I ever did was when I was in a revival service and heard an elderly man with a gray beard say these words as he preached that day. He said, I wasted 20 years of my life. 20 years of my life I could have been working for God, but yet I squandered it away and I wasted 20 years of my life. It was during that time that I was in the valley of decision as to what I was going to do with my life. And I said to the Lord that night, I said, God, if you want me, get me now. Because I don't have 20 years to waste. So what about this this morning, this wonderful gift of grace? Now again, this may be a scripture that I had not necessarily studied for the whole message, but it's where I felt like that God told me to go as we opened it up here this morning. He says in 1 John chapter number 1 and verse number 9, look what the Word of God says. He says, if we confess our sins, the Bible says in Romans that confession is made unto salvation. When you confess, it means an acknowledgement or an admittance of guilt. For the Bible reminds you and I, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Can I ask you a question today? If you and I were to go to heaven, I think Brother Tatum said this as well. But if you and I were to die today and stand before God at the gate, if you will, going into heaven, what reason would you give Him today that would allow you to get into that glorious land called heaven? How would we stand there today? You would say, well, I did this, I did that. Well, I was pretty good at this right here. But, I, you know, and all these things that we could come up with, in all reality, the only thing that's going to accommodate that or make us a candidate for this glorious place called heaven is the free gift that God has given you and I through His dear Son. I know this might sound simple. It might sound elementary. It might sound uh, uh, the beginning point. It might sound like you needed something deeper today, something that was going to astonish you and make you walk away amazed at how smart I am. But no, I don't think that's it at all. I think that the simple fact that God says you've got to tell the people that they've got to confess with their mouth. Again, I don't know, and maybe you did that 38 years ago. I have no idea. But there might be somebody today that's never experienced this glorious thing called salvation. I thought to myself as I was studying and preparing over the weekend and over the last few days from Thursday moving forward to the weekend. And again, it's just me today. And this is how I feel today. And you may not feel the same way I feel, but I'm amazed and what Jesus did for us. You think about it. You think about what Jesus did on the cross. You think about what Jesus went through on the cross. To think about what he did to give you and I this wonderful gift called salvation. Again, when we look at this scripture, and I'm going to jump off into this in just a second. And try to finish it, if not this morning, on into the evening service, if you will. If we confess our sins, sins is what? Missing the mark. He said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, if you look at this, if we confess our sins, I love this, because the Bible says, He is faithful. Why would God love an old sinner like me? Why would God be so faithful to me when I have been so unfaithful to Him? Hello? Why would God be so faithful to me when I have been so unfaithful to Him? 
Think about that. When you were in your sins and you were in your transgressions, you will. When you were torn apart from God in the wickedness of, of the Bible says that we all have like sheep strayed and went our own way. You know, God kept wooing you and God kept drawing you. Somebody in this room might say, why would God ever love an old sinner like me? Because that's pure love. Because the Bible reminds us in the good book of Romans that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. And I'll get into that part a little bit later on. But he says here that we would have to confess our sins. We have, would have to admit our guilt. We would have to admit the error of our way. And once we do that, the Bible says, if we will do our part, then God will do His part. And as we have been faithful to God, God will be faithful to us. And then He says that God is faithful and God is just. God is just. And we can talk about that at a later time. I studied it, but I don't want to get into it right now. But God is just. To justify you and to justify me. God can do for you what you're not able to do for yourself. Sometimes we have a hard time forgiving ourselves for the injustices that we've done. Sometimes we have a hard time because the memory of, of, of the things that we've done in our past or the memories that we've done in our life. But I'm going to tell you something, friend. God, the Bible says, God is just. And, and there's a whole different element of that that I can get into a little bit later. But this is what he says, that God is just to forgive us. Forgive us of all of our sins. God will take, Brother Robert, and God, the Bible says, He'll take our sins and He'll cast them as far as the east is from the west. One preacher said, and God will put up a no fishing sign. You can't go back and pick up those things and, 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 and water them over and over and over again. If, if you have confessed your sin, this is the only thing I can say. Confess it to God and accept His forgiveness and forget it. That's what God says. He said in the word of God to forgive us of our sins. Look at this. And to cleanse us. To cleanse us. To purify us. To make us holy and clean within uh, again of all unrighteousness. Now I know that when you think about the word sin. We think about the word, about the word sin. And it talks about missing the mark. But when you look into 1 John chapter number 2 and verse number 1. Again, this is the marvelous thing about Jesus today. And this is what I, this whole thing, I wanted this whole thing as I felt like this is the direction that the Lord would have me to go in today. It's for you and I to look at the grace of God with a, a new view of, of, of what God has done for us now watch this. We live in a, well, we live in a secular world. We live in a world that seemingly is just getting worse as Brother Scott opened up the Sunday school lesson this morning. It, it, it seems like it's getting worse every day. And it just seems like the attitude of gratitude is an attitude that you don't see in our world much anymore. You just... Similarly, run into folks all the time that are just not thankful. But when we think about the attitude of gratitude that we need to have towards God, again, the Psalms talks about that. Thessalonians talks about that. How that we need to be thankful unto Him. That you and I today, for what God has done, this marvelous gift of grace, that we need to have an attitude of gratitude. And, and don't get mad at me. I've not been locked back long enough for you to get mad at me. But nobody should have to coach you or to coerce you or to beg you to worship Jesus. 
We ought to be the most joyful people on planet earth because we know that God has forgiven us of our sins and that we are on our way to heaven. Our name has been written down in the Lamb's book of life and we ought to be singing praises unto Him as the Bible said from the rising of the sun to the going down to the same that the name of the Lord is to be praised. We ought to be a people that are filled with gratitude because Jesus has washed all our sins away. He's done this. He's forgiven us. He's cleansed us. He has been the one to take away the the sting of sin, if you will, so that you and I can stand before Him pure and holy because of the blood of the Lord Jesus. And He has declared us righteous, not we ourselves, but because of what Jesus did. Jesus did this on the cross. The blood that Jesus, the blood, Martha has never lost His power. The blood that came streaming down the old, the old rugged cross. It's still the blood today, 2,000 years plus later, that's cleansing wicked men and sinners, uh, boys and girls, uh, from their sins and being captive to the enemy of their soul, which is the devil. And when you open up this next verse, he gives a, a, a precursor, just like Brother Scott said, little children, whether it be the young ones or whether it be, and I'd already looked at that, Scott, when you said that, I thought, he got me on that one and I appreciate that because whether it be a little one or whether it be a young person in the Lord or whether it be a, a somebody that's just starting out in the way. He said, my little children, he said, these things I write unto you that you sin not. God don't want you to sin. Somebody says, do I sin after I become a Christian? Every person in this room is susceptible to sin. I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care how many saints you got before your name or after your name. We are all susceptible to sin. But it is not God's will that you sin. It is not God's plan for your life that we sin. Somebody says, are you a sinner? I mean, Larry don't need to go into that conversation today. I was a sinner, but I am not a sinner now. Swimmers swim, runners run, uh, and etc. and so forth, and sinners sin. No, sinning is not something that once you get saved, uh, that you go out on purpose and intentionally do, and you do it willingly, and you Sin, knowing that you're sinning when you're doing it. He changes the nature of the person. And that's another message that I don't have time to get into right now. But the point of the matter here is simply this. Think about the gift of grace. If you sin. Now I know there's some people that I've come across in my life. They're so high minded and so holy that they don't sin no more. God bless your heart. I still struggle with Alan Green every day. I struggle with this old boy every single day with my attitude, with my mouth, with my eyes and the things I say and the things I do, how I treat my wife, how I treat my children, how I treat my dogs, how I treat chickens that I'd like to shoot. Mackenzie's listening to me for attacking her last week when I was gone. And you think about all these things. I was sitting on the back porch. Mackenzie, is she back there? I was thinking last night I was sitting on the back porch. I've got a 22 rifle. I'm pretty good with it. I'm a mountain boy, remember? I got a 22 Marlin rifle with a squirrel on the stock of it. I sat in there last night, and I was tempted of the devil. I seen that rooster. I've got a Polish game rooster, and he's mean. You go in, buddy, you better be watching your ankles. He got CJ last week feeding him. I thought, you know what? I could get that rifle, and I could set it across that picnic table, and I could shoot his eye out from right here. Jesse, I thought about that last night. I thought, no, you don't want to kill that rooster. Now, somebody says, is that sin, preacher? I don't know if it's sin or not, but the rooster's thanking God today that I changed my mind. <laughs> and changing your mind has everything to do with your sin. Hello? I didn't know I was going to use that little funny analogy, but I tell you what, you've got to change your mind. I heard Pastor Boland say something years ago. He said, true repentance takes place. Not that you got caught with your hand in the cookie jar. But true repentance takes place when your heart is grieved over the things that has grieved the heart of God. 
You've got to change it up. And then he says here in this word, he says, and this is the great the gift of grace right here. And again, there's, there's volumes of stuff I've got in front of me. Volumes of stuff. But he says, and if, if's a two little bitty word there, a two letter little bitty word. A little big word, if. Which means to me that there is a potential there to sin. Maybe not for you, but for me, when I looked at that rooster last night, I wanted to shoot his eye out with a twenty-two rifle. I thought I could shoot that joker from right here and he'll never even know what hit him. I thought, no, I don't need to shoot that rooster. I need to, I had to change my mind. And the devil's always going to be out there to tempt you and me to do things that you know and I know that we should not be participating in. You've got to change your mind. Now, that was free. That didn't cost you nothing. But if any man sin, look at this. We have an advocate. We have an advocate. We have a, a lawyer. We have an attorney. We, 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 we use that word in the context of, of the scripture. But that word advocate just simply means one who stands in proxy or one who stands in the gap for another. When you and I were yet sinners, the Bible says in Romans 5 and 8, I believe it is, that while you and I were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I don't know about how that's striking you today, but that's been on my mind for days and days and days and days, Brother Steve. I could have died in my sins. I could have went to hell. I could have not had the people in my life that, that, that talked to me as a youth and talked to me as a young person that pointed me in the right direction. Now listen to me, young people, if you're here. You may not always agree with everything that an elder person will say. But here's the thing. Don't turn away a deaf ear to good instruction according to Proverbs. How will a young man or a young lady cleanse their way by giving heed unto the word of the Lord? One of the things that God blessed me with as a young person, when I was out mowing yards for little old ladies and, and, and little elderly women, and, and, and I've told you this before, making $4 for mowing a yard and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and an orange crushed soda pop, if you will. That was my pay for doing their yards. Oh, but Brother Larry, they would sit there and I'd sit there and they would pour volume of wisdom into me. Stuff I didn't even know was happening at that time. And it was all through my teens and all through my young adulthood that God put the right people at the right time at the right place and they poured into my life and they and I would listen I listen I had sense enough to hear what they were saying to me now let me let me meddle here for a minute or two it just behooves me and it just blows my mind that you can talk to young people today and I'm not mad at no young people I'm begging you I'm trying to save you a whole lot of anguish and a whole lot of trouble in your life. And somehow or another today you can talk to some young people. Not all young people, but some young people. And you've heard the phrase and I've heard it, the phrase, it'll go in one ear and out the other. And the only way that they'll ever learn anything is through the pain and the anguish that they suffered as they go through life. Listen to me. God sometimes has allowed you and I to suffer the anguish and the, and, and the decisions of our own actions uh, in order that God, as the scripture says in the Old Testament, that God would put a hook in their jaw and that God would bring them back to Him. Now again, I'm meddling for a minute. I don't want to have to experience the bad things of life any longer, especially at my age, in order for me to fall in love with Jesus and to do what Jesus would have me to do. But he says here in the Word, if any man sin, he has an advocate. He has one who is pleading our case before God. He's pleading our case 
before God. Now, again, if I wanted to get into the text and a whole lot of other stuff that I'd studied, I've studied for days on this. I'm just going to tell you where it's at, and then you can go to it, and maybe we'll get back into it tonight. If you go into Romans chapter 5, and you pick up there in verse number 12, and you read through the end of that whole, whole chapter right there, it tells you the story of how that sin entered in by one man's decisions. Adam and Eve was there in the garden and how that the serpent come in Genesis 3 and how the serpent came and beguiled Eve and Eve said, hey, big boy, come here, I need to talk to you. He was Johnny on the spot. He thought something big was getting ready to happen, but I don't think he expected the simple fact that Eve was getting ready to, to give him of the fruit that the serpent had tricked her into eating. And from there, Adam and Eve entered into this relationship apart from God because they had sinned, this great sin. And, 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 and how that, that, that the Bible even teaches us in various different places of how that Cain was evil and how that Cain slew his brother Abel and how that sin entered in to the, the human race. All throughout the human race, from Adam unto now, there's this terrible, wicked thing called sin that affects you, it affects me, and it affects everything we do. But yet, Romans talks about this. And I'm not going to get into that because it's like 10 verses I don't have time to get into right now. I'll just give you a little synopsis of it and a little quick look at it. But it said because of this one man's sin, that sin entered in to the human race. You might not be able to do anything about the simple fact that you were born into sin. You may not even be able to do anything about the the sinful urges, listen to me, that you have in your, in your person from time to time to do those things which would be wrong. But Jesus paid it all. And it said by one man's death, you can look there in Romans and he says that, and he says about this one man's death, this one man's death of how that life has been given to you and to me. And again, I'm not going to turn there and read it right now. But because of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of what Jesus did, the gift of grace, because Jesus did for you what you could not do for yourself. You can't save yourself. You can't redeem yourself. But again, when you look at this scripture, he talks about this in, in and I, I got ahead of myself a little bit, I realize that, but in, in, in 1 John there, chapter number 2, he says that we have an advocate. We have the one Jesus who is pleading before God for your sins and my sins and your life and my life. And I don't know how that hits you today. I don't know how that works with you today. But all throughout the scripture, maybe I'll get into it tonight. He talks about this, this free gift. Free, well, think about that. Free gift. If I had a stack of $100 bills this high that was about $25,000. Sorry. And I was up here handing out $100 bills, and all you had to do was walk up here and get it. I dare say everybody in the building would come by and get their $100 bill. Then you'd go to Chick-fil-A tomorrow morning when it opens up. If you were giving out $100 bills, I'd come to the front and I'd say, thank you. We all would do that, right? Don't tell me no, you'd do it. It's this free gift of salvation. It won't cost you anything. But your whole entire person. Now here's the thing. Again, this is how I feel. You may feel different than me. Reva, there's not one cotton-picking thing, country word, that I would have to go back there and get after I got redeemed. I left it all behind. 
It's amazing how God will put it in your heart to hate the things you used to love and love the things you used to hate. There's not one thing that I'd have to reach back behind me and get and pull along today and say, well, I'd go, like to go back and get that. He frees us. He frees us from those things of our former life, those things that bind us up, those things that tear us down, those things that tear us apart. And again, I don't have time to go back through this whole thing, but he says, if you look at this, he says that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Verse number two says that he, he is the propitiation. We don't, we don't like that word because we don't understand it. But it means that he is the propitiation for our sins. In other words, the, 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 the Greek word and the understanding of that is to appease. In other words, where there was wrath and where there was judgment, where there was going to be condemnation over your life for the sin that you had committed. The Bible says that there is therefore now, Romans 8 and 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because Jesus put it on the cross. He bore it for you. He bore it for me. He became that propitiation. He became the appeasement, if you will. He's the only one, the sacrifice, the only one that would ever appease the wrath of God over sin in your life and my life. Are we okay today? This whole thing was a simple fact that it still overwhelms me. Brother Steve, of the goodness of God, to love us when we don't even love ourselves. To care for us in ways that we don't understand. Let me make an analogy like this. It's the only thing I can think of. And moms and dads and mamas and papas and aunts and uncles and everybody else may be able to associate this in some way, shape, or another. I struggle sometimes in areas that I'm getting ready to tell you. I know people. I know a lot of people. I don't associate much with them. But I do know people that operate under the Old Testament concept an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth or whatever it says there. Jesus said, you've got to love one another. If somebody smacks you on one side, just turn to them the other. George Moxley says, yeah, and don't say what to do after that. But here's the thing. All of us know people that's done us wrong. Children. I don't really even want to go there. But children that's done parents wrong. Parents that's done children wrong. Family members that hate each other and can't even get along. You can't even talk to each other. And you know what? It's more rapping than you would think. Aren't you glad God don't have that kind of approach to us? That even... While we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. And again, it just blows my mind simply because that, that even in the day and the hour that we're living in, that God would still love us, even though we have failed Him and faltered so many times. You may be here in this room and you may be saying, Preacher, if you had only known what I'd done last Thursday evening, you wouldn't be saying what you're saying to me right now. Well, guess what? I was looking. I know. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know anything that anybody's done or not done. That's not my place. But if you did do something last Thursday evening, you better listen. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. But if you did, if you did do something, 
You know what? God will still love you. And God will still forgive you. God will still say, come unto me. Because he cares about you. It blows my mind, Dale, at the mercy of God. It just blows me away. Just a good grace of God. I would tell you just to stand with me unless I'll be dismissed. Come on, stand with me. I told you I didn't know where to stop these messages. I have no clue. <laughs> I got four or five more pages of notes that I can get into. I'm not going to do that to you. Bow your heads with me for just a minute. Maybe you're here today and you feel like that there's no way God could love anybody like me. Well, you're the very one that God had me to preach this message for today. It's because it's not about how good we are or how we are at anything. The Bible just says that as we come to Him and confess our sins, that God is faithful and God is just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. God is just wanting your confession. He's wanting your admittance. Then the Bible says in the good book of Romans, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that the Lord Jesus Christ died for you, He says, then you can be saved. There's not a person in this room or listening to me by any media that wants to go to hell. Nobody. That I, not, that I would ever imagine. But God is saying today is your free day. Get out of jail free day. All you got to do is accept Him in your heart. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Again, I don't know who's here, who's listening. I have no idea. Maybe today God spoke to your heart. And you alone know whether or not you're saved. You alone know where you stand with God today. Alan Green don't know that. But you do. And if you search over your life and you see anything in your life that ought not to be there, simply say, Lord Jesus, I ask you today to cleanse me of all sin. And to cleanse me of all my transgressions. Lord Jesus, I admit with my mouth that I have failed you. I have faltered along the way. Now Lord Jesus, I pray that you would come into my heart. Forgive me of all of my sins. Forgive me of all my transgressions. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you would give me a heart like yours. God, that you would give me a heart to serve you. And to honor you. And to love you. And Lord Jesus, I thank you for redemption. I thank you for saving me. I thank you for doing a work of grace in my heart. Because God, I know I don't deserve it. But God, your grace gives me that unmerited favor with you. I can't work for it. I can't earn it. I don't deserve it. But God, you've done it because of the blood of Jesus, because of your son, Jesus. That you did not want your son's life to be in vain. And Jesus came to save sinners. And Father, I thank you for that salvation. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. If you're in this room, you've prayed that prayer, wave at me. Just raise your hand straight up in the air and back down. Anybody else? And you know today that God has saved your soul for all eternity. God has done something in your life afresh and a brand new today. For those of you that raised your hands today, get on the right path. Come to church. Study the Word of God. Get a hunger for God. Jeremiah 29 and 13 says, if you'll seek me, you shall find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Get after God. And God will get after you. I promise you that. Amen. Five to six people raised their hand this morning in this room about this message today. My prayer is that you will get earnest after God and that you'll serve Him with all of your heart. 
And God bless you today. Amen. Six o'clock tonight, we're having church time. Be right back here this evening. And we'll be digging right back into the Word of God. God bless you as you go. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen.